Hi, I'm John Paul Jackson, and I'd like to talk to you today about something that's very dear to my heart. The Lord began to speak to me the message that I'm about to bring to you several years ago. But in June of this past year, 2008, He began to push me to speak about it in several conferences here in the United States and abroad. Because some of the facets of the perfect storm happened so quickly after I wrote about it, I feel compelled to tell you that as a means of verification, one of the places I spoke on this topic was in a conference held by John Kilpatrick in July of 2008. The Lord then asked me to write it down and to send it to those on my mail list, and I did this the 1st of August. Though some of what I have already written has come to pass, most of these things will take place 10 years from now. In other words, it will take some time for it to totally play out. Further, though most of what we see today is seemingly economic-based, much of what I have written is not. This perfect storm has several components, which I will later cover. I'm delivering this message with a heavy heart, as I said. Those of you who have followed this ministry have heard me say more than once that during the past eight years, as we approach the year 2010, things will become increasingly difficult. I have been praying and hoping that what I'm about to speak may be averted. However, I'm now concerned that without people speaking up, the church will not play its redemptive part in bringing the necessary change to this nation and the world. I pray that you'll understand my heart as I speak. I believe you'll be given wisdom by the Lord as to how to process and potentially thrive in the coming perfect storm that is brewing in this nation and beyond. Before I go any further, I just want to take a moment to say something to you before you hear what I'm about to say. This is very important because some of you may hear what I'm about to say and you may think that the wrath of God has come. And what I'm talking about is not the wrath of God. What I'm talking about is a loving God who is chastening his children because they're headed the wrong direction. So I, when you listen to what, what's going to be said about the coming events, about things that are going to be happening in the world, please understand this. These things happen when righteousness fails to rule. God wants this nation to be everything it's called to. He loves this nation. He loves America. He loves you. But he can't keep, let us keep on the path that we're on because we're not following the dictates of why we were created in the very first place. What this nation was founded on needs to be, come back into alignment with God's purposes and God's plans. The church has to become a, a living light again. The church has to become something that is a change agent in this earth, especially a change agent in this nation. And this message is designed to help bring that about as people seriously listen to what is going to be happening and uh, what the plans of the evil one are if we don't do something to stop it. There are five elements to the coming perfect storm. As in the movie, The Perfect Storm, uh, I see the storm that is coming to the United States as a combination of more than one element. And when the elements unite, the storm becomes exponentially more dangerous. However, unlike the movie, this storm is not just a storm of merging weather patterns. This storm is worse. It involves five different elements, religion, politics, economics, war, and geophysical events. At times, these five elements will be so intertwined that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish which elements are driving a particular manifestation of the storm. Massive problems in these five areas will come often and in combination and sometimes repeatedly. Each element has potentially several elements that will have national and international ripple effects. Some ripples will be worse than others depending on where you live and how you make your living. Different areas of the United States will experience different severities. Some will experience more economic elements and others more geophysical elements. Some will experience all the elements. Remember, it's the combination and the rapidity that will make the storm problematic. Also, this does not mean all five elements of the storm will hit at the most devastating levels. For example, on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst, one element may strike at a six, while another strikes at an eight. It's the particular combination of elements, the proximity of each element, as well as the intensity of each element that will make this storm so difficult and seem to last so long. 
the storm will not be short-lived. It will come in waves one after another. I'll be back to talk about why this storm is coming. Why don't you get some coffee and a pen and paper, and I'll be right back. We'll see you in just a moment. Now that you're back with a pen and paper, there's, a, there's going to be a lot that you're going to have to understand, a lot, lot to cover in this, I, I know. So I'm going to try to take, take more time with it. But the, the question has to be asked, why is this storm coming? Well, this storm is coming because the church, the body of Christ, really is no longer the backbone of this nation. From our inception, the Christian faith has been the plumb line of decisions made at all levels of life in this country. The Christian founding of this nation is what makes it different from every other nation on the face of the earth, maybe other than Israel. Other nations may have become Christian in their focus, but none were initially formed with Christianity as the core of its DNA. The church is to make known God's manifold wisdom to the world and the powers of the air. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.2. 2. But this demonstration of the heavens is not accomplished by speaking to those powers. It is through righteous living that we will make that known. How, do we, how we live opens or closes doors for Satan to legally afflict us and potentially rule over us via leaders who do not know the ways of God. The basic principle is simply this. Now get this, sin separates us from God. Since Adam and Eve through today, the actions of humankind have given room for the enemy to strike and attack humanity. So how does this happen? It really is pretty simple. If you could picture you as this hand or this nation as this hand and God's hand covering it. Sin, whenever we sin, causes God's hand to lift. To the degree God's hand lifts, the enemy has a chance to come in. And right now, God's hand is lifting off of this country. Some people call this judgment, and I would agree. If that's the definition of what judgment is, I would agree that, that, is, that this is judgment. Judgment simply being then, the removal of God's hand allows the enemy to attack his people. The only legal way the enemy has access to us is by the hand of God lifting. This results in there being a space between him and us. And as that space increases, we distance ourselves from him and his ways. Anytime there's an increased distance between God and humanity, it leaves room for attack to come and for principalities and powers of the air, rulers of darkness, to take up residence afflicting the people or a nation. The longer that dark powers reside over an area, the more the people begin to call right wrong and wrong right. In other words, it affects the culture. So here in the United States, leaders arise from the people or the culture. In other words, as the people believe and think, so do the leaders believe and think. As the lines between right and wrong, as well as the holy and the profane, become blurred, leaders make choices. Those choices reflect their upbringing. Those choices have dramatic impact on you and me. One consequence of the choices is this, that in this nation, the way to God through Jesus and the cross is no longer seen as an absolute. In fact, absolutes have become touted as intolerance, first by the world and now even within the church. Yes, I understand there are many exceptions to this within, within the church culture, but it's, it's changing and the lines are gradually, slowly being blurred. Without, it's through compromise that the absolutes of heaven and eternity are clearly evaporating in this nation. God can fashion a disaster. A lot of people don't understand that, but we're living in the times, I believe, of Ezekiel and Jeremiah who wrote that God can bring a disaster upon our nation if we continually choose to walk according to our own plans. God spoke this to Jeremiah. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to, to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build it and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. Now therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. 
Return now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. The Lord goes on to say in verse 12, And they said, or the people said, We will walk according to our own plans, and we will everyone obey the dictates of his own evil heart. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 12. I believe we are living in such a time. What are some of the early evidences that this storm is coming? You're going to look in five areas. The first one, geophysical. The cold that we've recently experienced in California and the snow, the record snows that are there. Record ice storms in, in the, the northeast part of the United States. 2008 has been decli- the, declared the coldest in 20 years here in the United States. War. Iran has three times the number of long-range missiles that we thought. The Israel and Iranian uh, tension and the continued escalation buildup of that. The tension that is escalating between India and Pakistan is also another issue. In the political system, the the Greece youth violence issue that's going on and the riots that are taking place in Greece, the growing cry for a one world government in the world as well as in the United States as the financial crisis and global implications of anything are pushing national governments toward global solutions. Even in countries such as China and here in the U.S. that are traditionally fierce guardians of national sovereignty, there's a growing whisper of this. The corruption charges, like those with the governor of Illinois, will not be the last political corruption charges that will be brought or discovered. In the area of religion, there's a decline of the influence of Christianity in this country, but also in in many other countries around the world. There's a lack of absolutes in the Christian worldview here. There are growing efforts by the state of Islam to insist that Christians uh, make an announcement that the Islam community and the Christians serve the same God. Absolutely not true, but there is a push for that to happen between Islam and the Catholic Church. And the issue of economics, we're going to find out that as the water table of economic stability decreases, there's going to be many rocks that are going to be exposed. What do I mean by that? Simply this, that when water levels go down, rocks on the bottom begin to show. The, the issue of the Madoff scheme that has been estimated to total as much as $50 billion is not the last financial domino that's going to fall. There's going to be many more uncovered. States are going to be facing financial crisis. In a recent study by the Center on, Bu- on Budget and uh, Policy Priorities, it revealed that 41 states are facing severe budget shortfalls for 2009. Some states are worse off than others, with California at $31.7 billion and Florida at $5.1 billion, leading the deficit pack. In all, the 41 states currently are facing $71.9 billion in budget shortfalls. The key word here is currently, because that could increase as other facets or other other things are made known. Wow. So what are some of the things that are coming? Some of you already, you, most of you already know what I've just, I've just talked about. What are some of the things that are coming? Well, we're going to come back right after this, and we're going to talk about the coming things that you should expect in the next 10 years. So what are things that are coming, or perhaps better said, what are the consequences of our choices that are coming? Here are some of the things that I've, I've seen so far. In the geophysical arena, I keep hearing a sentence in, my, in, in some dreams that I've had, as well as, as in my prayer times, and I keep hearing this, this, this one sentence, the woes of, two, of 2012, the woes of 2012. I don't know what that means, but I do know this. The time frame that we've entered into is not a short time frame. It's going to last quite some time, and we're going to become closer to God for it. Some of the other things that are going to be happening in geophysical issues are jet streams are seemingly going to go wild to weather forecasters and cause major weather shifts around the world. There'll be drought in some areas, And water from some of your faucets will be more expensive than oil. Some cities, in fact, will evacuate thousands because there's not enough water to meet their needs. As Amos 4.7 says, I, or God, I make it rain on one city and I withheld rain from another city. Earthquakes will begin to strike not only coastal areas, 
but even the Midwest will experience a devastating one. In fact, the Midwest may experience one before any coastal city does. A volcano will erupt and begin to become active and eventually erupt in the United States again. There will be thunderstorms with softball-sized hail and 24 inches of rain within a 24-hour period of time. There's going to be places where three feet of snow will fall in a six-hour period of time. There will be times when tornadoes strike this nation with winds of more than 350 miles an hour, and there will also be a tornadoes in unusual places. In other words, places that typically don't have tornadoes will experience them. There will be a hurricane that ends up striking this nation with winds of over 180 miles an hour and storm surges that flood miles inland. There will be a hurricane, at least one hurricane, with a storm diameter of around 500 miles. There will be an unexpected blight that's going to hit a type of hybrid seed and weaken the yield as, as almost like a strike of God against the mind of men who thinks they can control seed output. In addition, in addition to drought and devastation from storms, there's going to, uh, these storms are actually going to dramatically cut into various harvests and national food shortage will uh, happen as the food storage program begins to be depleted. There will be academic, uh, an epidemic that will take many lives, and it will not just be here in the United States, but it will also be here and elsewhere. It might actually begin elsewhere and come in here. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, just as the prophet Joel spoke of. The, the bubble around our solar system, and I'm not exactly sure what this means. I'm just reporting what I have seen. The bubble around our solar system is weakening, and harmful rays will end up coming in and form new major skin sores or skin diseases that have been undetected before. Another thing that's going to happen is the Earth's magnetic fields are going to begin to shift, and as they shift, large cracks are going to form in that shield. This is going to somehow allow solar winds to affect weather patterns here in the, in the United States and other places in the world. This will also cause major problems with satellites and communication systems between airplanes and, and satellites and ground systems, etc. Your cable TV, for example, there's going to come a time when airplanes will even be grounded because of communication difficulties. Concerning the aspect of war, a dirty bomb will explode in a port city here in the United States. Israel will experience new and more devastating attacks with physical, physical nuclear material being released. Israel will then retaliate with missile strikes, and Israel eventually will bomb Iran, and anti-Semitism will escalate as fuel costs begin to soar once again. Russia is going to try to enhance this escalation of, of tensions by creating an oil crisis. They're going to end up taking or try to take control of the Ukraine, and they will continue to arm Iran with weapons to further ignite an oil crisis because conflict is the goal. And with conflict in the Middle East, oil prices will escalate. And Russia needs the oil price to escalate in order to meet their financial obligations and to rebuild the infrastructure that they are currently trying to rebuild. There's a, a new Mother Russia type of mentality that is going on to recreate the former Soviet Union. It may not be called the Soviet Union again. I, I don't know. But I do know this, that Russia is raising its head again, and an old monster is coming out of hibernation. When President Mubarak in Egypt is no longer the leader of Egypt, a new terrorist leadership will take his place and terrorism will begin to take even more, uh, a greater, higher profile than it has before. Pakistan will end up becoming much more terroristic oriented and become a harbinger of terrorists even more than it is today. On the economic side of things, a bubble of hope is going to come to this nation, but it will be short lived. And in that span, there's going to be just enough time for godly people to make the necessary adjustments. However, it will not be a time to take on additional debt. Commercial paper and credit card problems are another domino that is yet to fall, and I've seen it fall as joblessness increases and buildings lay empty. I saw malls that were more than half empty and stores that were closed, strip malls and, and, and other type of malls. 
at, with this. There's no, nobody's leasing the buildings, and so are very few are leasing the buildings, and so there's no lease payment that the owner needs in order to cover the debt service on that building. So there'll be commercial paper that will be uh, the problematic in the economic issue, especially with lending institutions. Some of that have asked, we had a financial planner the other day ask me, will there be stagflation or deflation or inflation or hyperinflation? And I had to look at him and tell them, it's going to be all of these. They're all waves on a quickly changing economic sea. And what has worked in the past will only work for a brief period of time in this changing economic era. There's going to be so many things. It's going to be more difficult than ever to forecast investments. But know this, God will guide those investors that he can trust. Those that he can't trust, then he will not bless them as he would love to. The dollar is going to begin to lose value and is going to become near on par with the peso and the Canadian dollar. A new uh, North American currency is going to be established. The euro has set the stage for what many may call the Amero dollar, and it's all in the plans right now. There will be many more reports of new financial corruption that are going to be uncovered even in the months and years that lie ahead. Again, this is a long-range problem, not a short-term issue. People will start to grow their own food in some cities, and in, in one or two cities, I actually saw them trying to pull up the streets in order to try to grow food. On the political front, we need to pray for the president, President Obama. We need to pray for his protection. There is a plan by Islam to try to take his life, and that would be the worst thing that could happen. You say, why would Islam want to take the president's life? Because it wants to start riots here as a means of destabilization and to divert attention from its own activities. What we are going to face and I pray, I, I pray against this. I, 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 all these things I don't want to happen. But we are going to see the worst riots in history. Some may call those uh, race riots, but they actually may be more economic in nature. As economic difficulties cause mobs to roam the streets and a Robin Hood mentality begins to escalate. In other words, taking from the rich in order to give to the poor. There will be many more reports of new political corruption that that is going to be uncovered uh, uncovered at very high levels. Terrorist activity will hit America again as a flaw in the border detection system is discovered by our enemies. Rural land will become very valuable as people leave the city to seek the security of, of an urban lifestyle. Social security and other retirement accounts will become of little value, I'm afraid. I just want to say this about the Social Security system. And here again, is it's the consequence of our choices. You see, there's very little that is wrong with the, with the Social Security system that wouldn't be fixed if there was 30 million more people giving in to that Social Security system. You see, there's 30 million babies that would be, would be wage-earning age at this time that are not giving... Uh, input or financial uh, inflow into the Social Security system. So in essence, because they are aborted children, what we're now facing is a 30 million people shortfall in the Social Security system. So the, the reality is this, we got what we wanted, but we will not like what we get. The, the United States, as time continues to go on and the economic crisis continues to escalate, the United States will bring home most of its troops in order to save finances. Because of the severity of the economy, the United States will end up cutting much of our foreign aid programs to to international and developing countries. The result will be that international dictators and Islam will multiply. In the religion field, Islam will will try to force its way into our school systems. It'll start by demanding that they have time to pray so they take prayer away from Christianity, but they allow the Islam uh, factions the ability to do that. Islam, again, is going to begin to systematically work to control a government in some large city in America. I didn't see which one it is, but it could be Detroit as they begin to mount a multiplication project. I'm not sure what the multiplication project means, but that's what I saw. 
Islam will continue to use threats to intimidate congressional decisions. Islam will launch an initiative to have a president in the White House by 2024. Medical advances in or- and organ transplants will make it possible for homosexual men to become in vitro fertilized and give cesarean birth. Many churches will file bankruptcy as payments on large buildings cannot be made. Large ministries will disband from financial difficulty. House churches will begin to grow in number as a need for intimacy increases. Hidden sexual perversion in church leadership will be exposed. And I'm not talking about in the Catholic Church. I'm talking about elsewhere. And the numbers will be shocking to many of those remaining in the church. God has fashioned this time to be the most effective in getting our attention. When he wrote, Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way and make your way and your doings good. It's time for us to think seriously about what's going on. Is this warning just for the United States? No, but it certainly includes the United States. I've focused on the United States, but it's going to be worldwide. So what can, what can we do? Are there, is there anything that we can do to lessen what's going to be happening? I believe there are four things that the church must do in this coming era in order for God's hand to be seen in our lives and to, be, and to prove that He is truly God working on our behalf. Come right back. We'll talk about those four things in just a moment. What are four things that the church must do in this coming era of the United States and globally as well? First, the church must return to knowing God and His ways rather than just knowing about God. We know a lot about Him, but there's not many of us that can truly say we know Him. We replace power with programs and revelation with administration. And worse, we replace the Father's heart with organizational skills. Secondly, The church must learn how to contend for the faith again. We're really weak, and we fall away so easily when crisis is not at hand. We've not been tested, and we've lost our resolve. We understand little of the adversary's plans. We do not know how to debate our faith without becoming angry, and thus we have so few clear and strong godly voices in the political arena. That has to change. We have lost our witness the witness that convicts others and strongly testifies that God is still God and He is very, very real. We've lost the witness that demonstrates that God is a personal God in a very impersonal world. The witness that says, what I do proves God exists, so watch me. Third, the church must return to the love of God's Word and the belief that it is infallible and inerrant. This would include the conviction, understanding, and knowledge that God is absolute, and there is only one way to know Him, and that is through Jesus, the Messiah. We need a new revelation that God's power is unlimited, His knowledge is unending, His presence is with us always, and He never, never changes. We've made God far too small, and our lives prove it. Fourth, we need to declare sacred and solemn assemblies of repentance and corporate fastings in many parts of this nation and beyond. A time set aside for rending our hearts before God. Here's what the Lord says about that. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and full of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Who knows if He will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering, and a drink offering for the Lord your God, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O God. May the Lord allow this to happen and give us the grace to do it. I just want to reiterate one more time, because it's very, very important. 
I am not talking about the wrath of God. I am talking about the love of God that is causing correction to be made to a nation, correction to be made to a people. So when you're listening to, to what I've just said and you're listening to about, what, to about what I'm about to say, please understand that God wants us to, be, us to walk into everything he's called us to walk into. He wants to redeem that which the enemy has tried to steal from us. He wants to make the church strong and vibrant again. And as you listen to this, we need to be thinking in terms of how can the church and you, we as a people, become strong and vibrant again and redeem what the enemy has tried to steal from us. We need to do this for the glory of God and his great name's sake. Crisis. Well, we're definitely in a crisis, but what is crisis? Crisis is the fruit of following the wrong God. God allows calamities to happen in order to draw us to himself. What does that mean? It means that God allows us to reap the fruit of that which we serve. Walking in God's ways brings blessings and fruitfulness of life, while walking in the ways of the God of this world will bring the fruit of the God of this world, decay, destruction, deterioration, and death. We make our choice, and then our choice will make us. Throughout Scripture, when crisis hit the people of God, they turned their hearts to Him, and He heard and took action on their behalf. He said this, When you call upon me, and you go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13. May the people of the United States seek the Lord with all their heart, and find him. Well, there's a beginning of the winds of sorrow, and you don't have to look very far for, to find those beginning swells of this coming perfect storm. It seems this theme has caught the attention of many pundits and prophets. Almost every day, there are multiple signs of the perfect storm's approach, and notice, I did say approach, meaning it isn't here yet. These things that we're seeing are merely the early winds of the storm. The scent of the rain, you might say, is in the air. Nearly everywhere we turn, we, we become more and more aware that without God's intervention, the world will not be the same in 10 years as it is today. And if you're thinking that, you are correct. So what are some of the ways that you can weather the storm? You can go through it with a, with a flash, you can go through it in ways that, that will catch everybody else by surprise, to those that are struggling and yet you aren't. What can you do? Well, here's five things you can do to keep in mind as you weather the storm with grace and prayerfully the glory of God resting on you. Number one, don't overreact to media hype and spin. They learned a long time ago that sensationalism sells and they will play it for all it's worth. In the midst of the media flurry, this is going to be a great time to listen to God and see what He might reveal even to you. So look for one. God is not caught by surprise. and His omniscience, He's been preparing you for this very hour. And that's right, I said, He's been preparing you. Nothing catches God by surprise. He knew this day was coming. He knew you would be alive here. And He's prepared you to be a champion in the midst of it. You will not fail. Remember what God told Jeremiah as well. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. In other words, those who don't know me. Do not be dismayed at the signs in the heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. Jeremiah 10, 2. People that don't know God are going to be very panicky, are going to be very dismayed, but that's, this is not the time to panic. When there is panic, we tend to make decisions we later regret. Don't assume the worst and don't be afraid. Should you plan? Yes, you should. Is this serious? Yes, it is. But it is not time to panic. Number two, simplify and streamline your life. What things do you do today that are pure convenience? Could you cut back on any of those luxuries? Keep your current car. Take in a roommate. How about reducing the latte count at the local coffee shop? Selectively start looking to cut back in areas that don't really reflect your life's mission or calling. They aren't making a positive difference in the lives of others. Check your life out. 
do things that count. This is going to be an opportune time to follow the discipline uh, of the disciples and their footsteps. It says this, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Acts 2.46 We need more of that simplicity of heart in our lives. Number three, connect with friends and family. God is your source, not your bank account, not your 401k, not your gold, not your stock portfolio. Your friendships and other relationships are what feed your emotional health and they stabilize you. You need them. Research shows that friendships play a dramatic role in getting people through difficult times. So reconnect today. Remember, a man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18:24. Friendship connect. Number 4, rethink your focus. You have a choice. You can live your life by principles or by pressure. Those who fail in life usually keep their eyes fixed on the current problems and lose sight of their life principles. As things change in this coming year, it is vital to remind yourself of the principles you live your life by. Never lose sight of them during challenging times. They'll keep you focused. The difficulties we're facing now may be God's wake-up call to remind you and us of our original vision, your original purpose, and why God made you the way He made you. Take this time to rethink and reevaluate. Remember, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. If you have no vision, your only other option is to go backwards or decay. Get a vision, the vision that God has for you. Number five, be an influence wherever you are. Are you an influence in your culture? For many, this will be a time of innovation and invention. For others, it will be a time of study and preparation for the promotion that will come when this season eventually passes, and it will. Don't chase the trends, but study them to see where the culture's going. You should always be looking for original and innovative ways to engage the needs of others. Needs are going to abound in this time, so ask God for a solution to those needs and you'll succeed when your secular peers are failing. Number six, take more time to listen. In the coming months and perhaps years, there will be an entirely new set of needs that the people and this nation will have. The Lord wants to give innovative ideas and inventions to those who are close to Him. So set aside time to listen to Him. Prayer is great, but if all we do is make our needs known to God, it will be very difficult to listen. There's a lot we don't know about this coming time frame. God just might have something He would like to say to you. You and I are living in a turbulent time. The perfect storm continues to swirl and won't dissipate for a number of years. Obviously, tough times are just that, and they can go far beyond that description as well. They're often disappointing, frustrating, and filled with tension and anxiety. However, if you focus on what you have lost or what you might lose, or if you focus on how difficult your life has become or what might happen, you're going to miss the most important aspect of why God allows times like these to begin with. What's one of the most noticeable things that sets you apart from your neighbors and co-workers who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus? Isn't it often how you handle these tough times? There are four things that must be etched into your spirit in order for you to succeed in a turbulent time like this. Number one, or first, tough times are not about what happens to you. They're about what you do with what happens to you. God, in knowing all things, was not ignorant about this era of your life. In fact, He spent your whole life preparing you for this very moment and others that you're yet to face. Will you keep believing that He'll use everything, everything you go through, for His kingdom purposes? Or will you sour along with so many others who base their relationship with God on their prosperity? Tough times prove our faith. How you handle these times will have great influence on two sets of individuals. 
those who watch how you handle your own adversity and those who will be changed by the counsel you give them. Now, I don't mean the answers you may or may not have for them. Everyone has answers, usually of the negative kind. But here I mean counsel that gives them hope, hope that gives them the ability to discover a God who knows their potential, a God who's taking them on a journey of discovering new adventures and possibilities that they may have never thought about, hope that aids them in making different choices than they may have previously made, hope that allows their creativity to spring forward when others around them are in despair. Well, perhaps you need this kind of hope, and God wants to give it to you as well. God allows tough times to happen so that massive change is the result. The hope is that God's plan, and in His plan, all things will be better in the aftermath. We'll once again place Him at the front of our minds. He'll use you to deposit this hope in many, many people during this era. God looked through all of the future and chose to place you here for such a time as this. He could have placed you anywhere, but He birthed you, created you, shaped you for such a time as this. You won't only make it, but you'll be an example to others, and as such, you'll have more influence than you've ever had before. Third, it's the people who focus on others and guard their words. For example, people who order their conversation to reflect the provision and kindness of God, even in the midst of the storm, who will see the salvation of the Lord. There isn't a single generation that hasn't gone through tough times. Yes, some are tougher than others, but as the Lord once said to me, little battles produce little victories, and little victories result in little champions. On the other hand, great battles produce great victories, and those victories will result in great champions. Which one do you want to be? A little champion or a great one? Fourth, the first thought most Christians have when tough times come is to diminish or even stop their giving. Wow, wrong move. It was the widow of Zarephath's faithful giving in the middle of a severe drought, by the way, that threw open the door for her to weather the drought that was at hand. Paul exhorted the church in Philippi to give so that fruit would be added to their account. They needed it. He urged the church in Corinth to take as an example the Macedonian church, the poorest church in Asia, which gave to the Lord's work even in the midst of their deep poverty and affliction. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. When Paul returned to the Macedonian church, just a few years later, He actually found them prospering. It's in the gift that you willingly give that allows God's justice to be active on your behalf. In tough times, especially in tough times, you really, really want God to act on your behalf. This is why Paul told the church in Philippi that more than the financial gift that he needed, he desired that heaven's fruit would abound in their lives. That fruit It's what God gives to feed and bless and meet the needs of all who give to Him. Giving in difficult times, even in times like Jacob's trouble, has always attracted the attention of God. When we come back, I'm going to answer the question, are we living in such a time as that? I believe we may well be living in a time much like Jeremiah the prophet described as Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 30 verses 5 through 9 this, For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with a child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? And all faces have turned pale. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is a time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck, and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God. However, even more incredibly, David had an incredible prophetic word in Psalms 24 about those who lived in the Jacob generation. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. 
for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity or idolatry, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory, Selah. What do we who live in the Jacob generation do? That's a very important question to ask because there's some great promises to us. First, this will be a generation of those who truly seek the face of the Lord, not just knowing about him, but becoming so close that you literally can see his face. Second, if you meet the qualification, something wonderful will happen. What are those qualifications? Very simple, but not easy to live in this culture. You must have clean hands and not harmed others. And if you have, you must have repented or you must repent so that you can be clean. You must have a pure heart with no hidden motives or agendas other than God's agendas for you. You must not be driven by ego or be self-promoting. What will happen to Christians then? First, there's going to be a much clearer definition or understanding of the term Christian. It will not include the current acceptance of lukewarm as it is included now. Even the Lord said he'd spew those out of his mouth. Number two, those, those who have this Jacob generation, you're going to ascend to the hill of the Lord or be elevated, promoted above those that are around you. Number three, you're going to live in the thick, holy presence of God. That means you'll hear him and be guided by him. Number four, the gates of heaven will be open to you. Those spiritual questions that have been difficult for you to understand or know will become easy for you to understand. Number five, the everlasting or ancient doors will be open, meaning ancient spiritual truths that have been hidden for a long, long time are going to be revealed. Number six, the might, strength, and power of the Lord and his host will come into your circumstances and situations, and they will fight on your behalf. Finally, number seven, the glory of the Lord will rest in your house. And the psalmist writes, Selah. In other words, think about it. In this time that we're facing, this time of a perfect storm, champions are going to be made. Great men and women are going to succeed. They're going to find things. They're going to see the needs of others. God's going to give them insight on what to do to meet those needs, and he, he is going to promote them. Promotion comes neither from the east or the west or the south, Psalm 75 says, but it comes from the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. He puts up one and pulls down another according to his good, good will and pleasure. You see, you were born for such a time as this. Acts chapter 17, 26 to 28 says that he determined the exact time that you would be born, the exact place that you should live. Doesn't that make sense to you? You see, God looked throughout all of future history and said, when would be the best time for you to live? And he designed you to live at this very time. He designed you to where that you would become a champion. He designed you that where you would have great influence. He designed you that where you would see the needs of others and you'd be able to meet those needs. Many of you he designed and you're going to have inventions. Others of you he's designed and you're going to have great healing in your hands. Many of you are, he has designed you're going to have insights and understanding into ancient things that have been hidden from the very beginning that maybe perhaps only the apostles understood. Great things are in store for those that seek the face of of the Lord. Doors are going to be opened. Ancient gates are going to be lifted up. 
you're going to see incredible moments in time and you're going to be able to realize I truly was born for such a time as this. Fear is your enemy. Remember, what you fear, you empower. What you focus on, you make room for. Fear God, focus on Him, and you'll make room for Him in your life. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? The answer is you. You may ascend to the hill of the Lord. You who have clean hands, you who have a pure heart, you who have not lifted up your soul to vanities, you who trust in Him are going to see the ancient paths opened for you. This is not a time for fear. This is not a time for sorrow. This really, really is a time for those who know their God to do great exploits. Trust Him. Believe in Him. Live for Him. Draw close to Him. And you're going to find that He will draw close to you. It never fails. Don't make God too small. You can never make Him too big. This is John Paul Jackson saying, God bless you. Keep tuning in to Awe TV, and we're going to find new things out together for the glory of this great God that we serve.